and that makes me want to put my head through a wall. Like, could you fucking just sit down and mind your own business? His fingers graze the edge of my panties and when I... Oh, sorry. <laughs> we need to contact the government. Something bad has happened. Aliens are on Earth. This book made me feel ill while I read it. It made me feel like I'm disconnected from fucking reality. And people are like, I love this romance. I love these people together. I love this couple. I've read a very few books that are like this bad and also this difficult to read. Like I actually found it like upsetting. <laughs> like I couldn't listen to it like on the tube because it made me feel weird. It was that bad. I feel like lots of people have read November 9. I feel like it's going in seasons. Like I do remember people reading it when it first came out like 2012 sort of time. Is that when it came out? I'm not sure. But I remember people reading it then and I remember the drama with witty novels and Colleen Hoover and basically getting a scene changed because of the ongoing theme of lack of consent. And so I've been aware of this book for like a long time and I didn't want to read it and I didn't want to like, you know, give it any more attention than it deserved for a long time. But then it kind of, everybody was reading it and I feel like I need to know how bad it is. And I was like, it can't really be that bad, can it? It's that fucking bad. It's so bad, oh my God. So to quickly summarize, November 9 is about Fallon and Ben who meet by chance on the 9th of November, which is the anniversary of Fallon's fire tragedy. And then they agree to meet up every November 9th for the next five years until they're old enough to be together. Old enough being 23. So. <laughs> It's a, it's a romance. It's actually marketed as a romance. That's where you'll find it categorised. That's where what it's listed under on Goodreads and on Amazon, which is an interesting place for it if you ask me. Ah! <laughs> oh my God, okay. So this will have spoilers and I do want to take us like through, you know, like moment by moment. However, I do have three main categories of um, crime that Colleen Hoover commits in this book. The first and the biggest is the ongoing issue with consent. This is a book that I, I feels like it exists in a different universe. Like romance novels often have an interesting relationship to consent. There are things going on to do with fantasy and like they're not really necessarily supposed to be realistic or to mimic real life relationships with real life consequences. However, this book, <laughs> it's, its relationship with consent is crazy. The next crime, Ben's obsession with fate. He's always talking about fate and what he actually means by fate is his own actions. Like his own actions are what really determine everything in this book. And yet he's like, fate is so crazy. It's so crazy when fate gets involved. <laughs> and it's like, no babes, those are your decisions. That's what you did. And the third thing that's arguably not as bad as the first two, um, but it's pretty up there, is Colleen Hoover's like addiction to using like booktube Goodreads language of 2012. It's in this book and it, it make it's like, <laughs> I don't know why she puts it in, other than that it was just, it, it's just a dated thing to do. But anyway, personally I hate it, but whatever. We're just gonna go by scene by scene, I think. So we begin the book with Fallon sat with her dad in a little restaurant and they're having kind of a tense conversation because Fallon had to give up her career due to her injuries. Um, and basically her dad's like, look, you're kind of not hot anymore, so like no one's gonna hire you. So already crazy, already fucked up, it's a bit like, this is, okay, this is where we're beginning, got it. And because this man's being addicted to his child, Ben has to obviously get involved. His little ears perk up and he's like, oh, I just have to insert myself into the situation. And he pretends to be Fallon's boyfriend. Somehow to kind of impress or piss off the dad, which does read as weird if you ask me. And it also reeks of smarmy 18 year old boy who thinks he knows everything, which we hate. <laughs> I don't know about other people, but there's definitely like a type of boy that exists that has read books and then decides to behave like men in books but in the cringiest most like obvious way possible and it's it's this this character like i've met people like this in real life and you know when you're like i know that you've seen women talking online being like oh my god i wish he would just act like this guy and then you do in real life but you're not like a pirate or like i don't know an assassin that's just weird that's this guy. That's what he's up to. So they're sat in the restaurant, they're having a weird awkward conversation and Fallon goes with it because she's like, yes, I do want my dad to be proven wrong. I want him to know that other men think I'm hot. Okay. 
So that's weird. And then we have the classic thing that any man has ever said about any woman in any book, which is, I could tell by the way she spoke to her father that she has sass, so I'm a little confused by her silence right now. Sass is a word that needs to be removed from the English language. It's like feisty. Why are women only ever sassy? Or like, it's always used derogative, isn't it? Then we really get to the best bit of their initial meeting, which is, this guy really announces really quickly that he's a misogynist. So he says, I seem to have a one track mind and that track leads straight to the two things I shouldn't even be thinking about right now. Her boobs, both of them. I know, I'm pathetic, but if we're just gonna sit here and stare at each other, it'd be nice if she was showing a little cleavage instead of wearing this long sleeved shirt that leaves everything to the imagination. It's pushing 80 degrees outside. She should be in something a lot less convent inspired. Obviously, because we're talking about this in a spoilery way, He's come here to see what she looks like and what her life is like after he nearly killed her and his like main big thought about her is that he's staring at her chest. <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm such a nice guy and I saved her from this awkward meal and conversation with her father so I could stare at her tits. <laughs> okay. Okay. Also, the awkwardness of her boobs, both of them. That's what I'm staring at. Her boobs. Boobs. <laughs> we continue further into the worst possible place to be, which is that he says, I begin to mentally undress her, and not in a sexual way. I'm just curious. Really curious. Because I can't stop staring at her, and that's not like me. My mother raised me with more tact than this, but what my mother failed to teach me is that there will be girls like this one who would test those manners merely by existing. Like, you're literally thinking about being sexually aggressive towards this girl whose life you've actually already ruined. And like, you know, you've created this massive trauma for her. Like, she has, a <laughs> she bears the effects on her body of your actions. And you come and you're like, oh my God, she's actually really hot. I, I just, you know, I just think that we could, you know. What? What? Also, what do you mean, like, not sexually? It's clearly sexual. And we also know that he's probably being weird and fetishy about the scars on her body that he put there. <laughs> also, I might add, I didn't know about the fire being, like, the big end plot twist um, before I read it, but I didn't know that everything else leading up to that would almost maybe be worse. So the two of them go and they hang out and they have, like, a date and essentially... The worst crime it commits, I would say, at this point, is that it just really reeks of really annoying 18-year-old perspective. And I don't even mean that in a beefy way to people who are actually 18. There's just something about being in the perspective of someone who's 18 that is a bit much. Especially because they're like, oh my god, I'm an adult now. You're not. No one's an adult. No one's an adult until they're 35, okay? Let's leave it at that for a start. And also, like, I think Ben does a lot of, I'm a man now, what does it mean to be a man? And it's like, probably not committing arson, it probably doesn't mean that, I would say. Be my number one guess. <laughs> you know what's funny is that I'd like to point out here that Fallon says that her mother is her hero. She says that she's her role model, but like the mum does not really actually play any kind of part in the story really till the end. So like, I think it's just funny that she says that here. <laughs> it's like, okay. She has an impact in that this is why Fallon doesn't want to just date this guy that she's met. She's like, I've got plans and I've got to move to New York to be an actress and da 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 da. And he wants that for her. He's like, yes, good, you should do that. And her mum has a thing that's like, oh my God, don't date between the ages of 18 and 23 because like, it's when you, you need to know yourself and all this stuff, which I do agree with. But my piece of advice for this is that you should date people in this time if you want to, because you can, you need defenses for later on. Otherwise you're gonna be putting up for some weird, stupid shit when you're older. And like, you gotta, you gotta rinse that out quickly, you know? You gotta, you gotta face it head on. <laughs> because it's, it's one thing to like, know yourself and know what you want and stuff and prioritize that. And it's another to like, fight for it or like, make sure that you're adhering to it when you get overexcited about other people and stuff like that. So that's what I would say. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Also another silly thing about this is that like, they go on and on about their lives outside of each other, but that's never in the book. Nothing actually really happens. There's only, like, two or three things that happen in the in-between times that have any effect on any other time. <laughs> like... It's just stupid. Anyway. Oh my god. Then we fucking get to this nonsense. He's like, you're a reader? And she's like, I love to read. You should hurry up and write a book, because it's already on my TBR pile. Come on! Come on! I... Stop it. And then he's like, 
your TBR pile? And she's like, to be rent pile. <laughs> ah! Anyway, and then we get to one of the lovely, lovely scenes where Ben really displays his misogyny once again. They want to go out for dinner and he's looking through her wardrobe deciding on what he'd like her to wear. And he says, too long, too ugly, too casual, too dressy. And then he picks this one that's quite revealing and, and she shakes her head, takes the dress from him and puts it back. And then his eyes fall to the dress he initially picked out and he pulls it off the hanger and shoves it at me. But I want you to wear this one. And she says, I don't want to wear that, I want to wear this. No, he says, I'm paying for dinner so I get to choose what to stare at while we eat. She says, then I'll pay for dinner and wear the dress that I want to wear. And he said, then I'll stand you up and go to Chipotle. And then they are like, ha ha ha, isn't that so funny and so cute? Babes, are we in reality? What the fuck are you talking about? So we have that. <laughs> we somehow, gets worse. Ben's jaw tenses and he looks away from me, down at the dress in his hands. Okay, he says simply, dropping the dress to the floor. Finally, thinks Fallon. But it's your own fault people feel uncomfortable looking at you. <laughs> and she gasps and she's upset and she's like, that's not very nice. And then he's like, it's the truth. <laughs> oh! And then he says, you wear your hair like you do because you don't want people to see too much of you. You wear long sleeves and collared shirts because you think it helps, but it doesn't. People don't feel uncomfortable when they look at you because of your scars, Fallon. They're uncomfortable because you make them feel like looking at you is wrong. And believe me, you're the type of person people want to stare at. And then he lists things that he likes for her. And he says, and your lips. Men stare at them because they want to know what they taste like. And women stare at them out of jealousy because they've had lips the colour of yours. They'd never have to buy lipstick again. <laughs> what? He's endlessly treating her like a sexual object. And he's also like, look. Be grateful. Men want to fuck you. Is that right? That's actually... So you, should, you shouldn't actually feel upset. You shouldn't actually feel upset about, you know, the disfigurement that's happened to you. Because of... Whose actions again? Whose actions? His! His actions! He started the fire that has caused this. And then he's like, oh, boo-hoo, you feel fucking sorry for yourself. Oh. <laughs> Genuinely, this makes me feel violent. Like, I actually can't believe someone's written this. And it's giving so, I'm just a boy and I tell it how it is. Shut up. Oh my god. And then essentially, because he wants to prove his point, he starts undressing her. And obviously, this is probably meant to be charged with sexual tension, but actually just really reads like assault. <laughs> this is Fallon's POV. I don't know what he's doing, and I'm terrified he's about to be the first person to see what's beneath this shirt but for the life of me, I can't find words to stop him. Before he makes his next move, I squeeze my eyes shut again. I don't want to see the look on his face when he sees just how much of my body was burned, most of my entire left side to be exact. I feel my shirt being pulled open and the more of me that becomes exposed, the harder it is to hold back tears. Then she says, I want to shove him out of the closet and close the door and hide, but that's exactly what I've been doing for the last two years. So for reasons I can't explain, I don't ask him to stop. Then he takes her top off. Da, 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 da. His fingers begin to rise up my hands and wrists just as the first tear falls down my cheek. The tear doesn't faze him though. I still don't dare open my eyes. I feel his forehead rest against mine. The fact he's breathing as hard as I am is the only thing that gives me a sense of comfort in this moment. <laughs> my stomach clenches when his hands go to the top of my jeans. This is going too far, too far, too far, too far. But all I can do is suck in a wild breath and let his fingers pop the bo button open on my jeans because as much as I wish he'd stop, I get the feeling that he's not undressing me for pleasure so weird i actually da, 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 and then he's like you're so fucking beautiful after he's essentially harassed her into taking her clothes off oh my god this genuinely like makes my heart beat a little fast because it's like it makes you so sad it makes you feel ill like he's literally it's such an evil thing to do like you know what's even grosser at the end of this she realizes he smells gross and she's like oh my god you need to have a shower before we go on our date ew what <laughs> How is this meant to read as sexy? As how is this meant to read as romantic? It doesn't. Oh my god! I can't even pinpoint where she says it. But he, she says at some point, "That's when I realised tears are still streaming down my cheeks." She's fucking crying her eyes out. She's fucking crying her eyes out. And then he's also like, "I want you to wear your hair up," because he's fucking not got enough demands of her this evening. <laughs> fucking hell. Touching her, and he's doing. Does this bother you? And then she's like, I don't actually know. And he, because he literally is mental. <laughs> he's like, I wonder if I'm the only one who's ever touched her scars before. 
the scars you put there, you, you're having like a weird, almost sexual, almost assault kind of moment, and you're like, oh my god, I wonder if I'm the only one who's touched her scars. What the fuck are you talking about? Genuinely. Like, and then he's like, about her scars, he's like, I should hate this for you. I should be angry for you. This going through this must have been excruciatingly painful. But for whatever reason, when I touch you, I like the way your skin feels. <laughs> Which obviously, if this were a romantic moment with appropriate romantic build and not a weird man who just kind of inserts himself into the situations and tells people what to do, and also was also not the secret cause of these scars, this could be romantic. There's a world in which these sorts of moments are romantic. It's not this one. It's not this one. And then they're talking about doing the November 9th thing and meeting up or not meeting up and all this kind of stuff. And then she's like, what if we fall in love with somebody else? And then he's like, what if we fall in love with each other before the five years is up? What if you fuck your dead brother's wife? What about that? What about that, Ben? Because <laughs> that's really what's fucking coming, isn't it? This might now be the second one. Because he, because they meet up and he's like, she's all confidence. And he's definitely got the vibe of like, that's because of me? Because I actually bullied her and like, was like, you have to fucking get your body out, Fallon. It's fucking weak of you that you don't let men treat you like a sexual object. <laughs> oh. Once again, we have the return of the fucking Goodreads language. He says something like, oh, you don't get alpha then today. And then she says, are you booksting me? And he cocks an eyebrow. Booksting? Yeah, when a hot guy talks books with a girl, it's like sexting, but out loud and with books instead of sex. Stop! It's so cringy, I hate it! <laughs> and then they're talking about hardbacks and how big his TBR pile is. Um, and that makes me want to put my head through a wall. As I said, probably not the worst thing that he's done in this book. You know what's so funny? They're discussing kind of the language of romance novels. In romance novels, the hero will say stuff like he owns the girl, his tiny little whatever, or like, you know, you're my bitch or you're my slut or all this kind of stuff. It's funny because he's like, oh, I don't think I could do what the guys in the books do. Is that okay? Things like find another man. And he says, I don't think I could own you with a straight face. And, and she's like, don't worry, don't worry. I don't think I'd like it if you said you owned me. And then we return to him bullying her. You know, you let your scars get in the way too much of your life. And he says, you listen to me, keeping his hands secured over my mouth so that I can't interrupt him. It pisses me off that you allow something so trivial to define such a huge part of you. I can't make you pretty in this book because that would be an insult. You're fucking beautiful and you're funny and the only times I'm not completely enamoured by you in the moments when you're feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> Sensitivity doesn't exist to this man. Like, the idea that you could have complex emotions about a big traumatic event in your life and how its effect on you. <laughs> that doesn't exist for him. He said, no. That doesn't exist, don't worry about it. And she gets obviously really upset about this. And she's like, my chest hurts, I can't breathe. <laughs> and then she says, my eyes rim with tears and I can't stop myself from shaking as I try to suppress them. And then he says, you deserve that, Fallon. And I nod, because he's right. <laughs> of course he's right. I'm alive and I'm healthy and yes, the fire left its thumbprint on my skin, but it didn't take the most important parts of me. It wasn't able to reach anything beneath the surface, so why am I treating myself like it did? And then he obviously consoles her, despite the fact that he's the one who's being a massive prick and was mean to her. And also caused the fire. Lest, lest, lest we not forget. <laughs> he's the one who fucking caused the fire that she's feeling sorry for herself about. Because that's, cause that's a real thing. And then Kyle comes in and punches Ben in the face because he's maybe actually the most sensible and most fucked over character in this whole book. Even, even on top of Fallon, you know why? Because he punches Ben in the face because he's like, you nearly killed this girl. Why are you fucking her now? Why is she your girlfriend? How is that in any way a sensible and or reasonable normal thing to do? And then also, he gets the most fucked over because then Ben starts fucking his wife when he's dead, which is crazy if you ask me. I can't even believe this idea like came to Colleen Hoover. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Something that he says that I hate just out of personal preference is that he's like, I study creative writing and communications because I'm a fucking pussy and I can't just commit and do creative writing on my own. I've got to do communications as well. I don't even know if communications is a degree in England. It might be, but I don't think it's as big in England as it is in America, I think. It's 
Just fuck it. You want to do creative writing. You want to be an author. You've that's what you're working on. Just fucking commit to it. Jesus. It's because American like American degrees are always pairing up loads of stuff. Like in England, you don't really pair up degrees unless they like go together. Like you can do like English and French or like English and history. You can't really do like English and maths because then you don't really have like a full whole degree at the end of it. Anyway. <laughs> Fallon also at this point says, Ben, did you know that November 9th is the date of the fire? And he's like, anyway, anyway, anyway. In a worse turn of events, Ben decides to get a tattoo that says poetic on his wrist, <laughs> which I'm sure is really poetic. <laughs> the idea that you want to get the literal word poetic tattooed on you as being poetic, <laughs> God, what the fuck do you mean? And it's also got musical notes in it, obviously. It's giving, it's giving budget tattoo that you get in the middle of the night, which is what he's doing. Fallon's leaving and, and Ben writes her a letter and he, in it he says, go visit your father. I know, I know, he's an asshole, but the but he's the only father you ever have. And when you told me I haven't spoken to him since last year, I couldn't help but feel at fault that. I feel guilty for the fight you guys got into because of my butting in. Yeah, it's a lot of things here that are your fault. Also, if she doesn't want to talk to her dad, who's being a dick to her, she doesn't have to talk to her dad. Like, it's not up to you, mate. Like, could you fucking just sit down and mind your own business for, like, one minute? For one minute, sit and mind your own business. But he can't. <laughs> then this is one of the worst possible quotes of Benton James Kessler's writing. She loved me, in quotations. She kissed me, in bold. I tried to keep her, in all caps. She left with an ellipsis. Jesus Christ, what in the name of fucking Facebook shareable poetry? <laughs> God, oh God. This is the next November 9th and Ben essentially is not coming because his brother's dead, which is very sad because he's in a car crash and Fallon is like, I'm gonna go to him. I'm gonna go to LA to be with him because he's obviously gonna be grieving right now. So then when she gets there, Jordan's pregnant and obviously kind of catatonic because her husband is dead. Ben is obviously very very sleepy but he's also so pleased that Fallon's arrived. So then basically they decide that they're gonna have sex. He's like you're a virgin and she's like yeah but only for a few more minutes. <laughs> and he's like I don't want to be your first Fallon, I want to be your last. <laughs> Can't cope, genuinely shut up. And then he's, she's like I want you to be my first and my last. Then he's like we can only have sex if you're gonna stay here for the rest of our lives. And she's like cool. <laughs> This is the worst possible bit. So he's like, he's, oh my God. He's like, his boxes have met their fate on the floor and an insurmountable display of willpower. He's pressed against me, but still not inside me. Fallon, he whispers, moving his lips slowly across mine. Thank you for this beautiful gift. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. Ugh. Why would you say that? Why would you say that? Oh my god. <laughs> and then it fades to black. Thank fuck. And then Fallon says, I'm not sure if sex is supposed to make you feel that you've lost a part of yourself to the person inside you, but that's exactly what it felt like. And just like the continuing, continuing worst possible things you could think and feel about sex in this book. And then they kind of talk about Kyle and what he's going to do in his life and all this stuff. And he's like, oh, it's actually none of your business. <laughs> He said, you don't need to worry about me and Carl. You don't need to worry about me and Ian and all this stuff. You know why? Because I'll literally physically intervene in a conversation between you and your dad, but you can't hear about anything to do with my life, obviously. This is one of the funniest things in this book now. So like once they have sex, he says, I was thinking about some of the things those guys say when they're with a girl, the ones we said we'd never say, like when a guy tells a girl he owns her. I know we've laughed about it before, but holy shit. <laughs> I never wanted to say anything like I wanted to say those things to you while I was inside you. It took everything I had not to. <laughs> and she's like, if you did, I wouldn't have asked you to stop. <laughs> now what I find particularly funny about this is that they're taking it so seriously. Like, it's so it makes so much more sense for me to people to say these things and it's like a fun game. So they've had sex now. He's like, oh my god, now that I've had sex with you, I actually want to own you. I actually want to own you. What? Like, 
I don't have a problem with this kind of like dirty talk in like books or like whatever. It's not like I'm judging people for you doing it. It's just funny because like it's so serious and also because of everything else misogynistic that he does you do just know that he literally means like he means literally he's like yeah i, w- I want to own you i actually do want to tell you what to do but it like <laughs> it only comes from the weird sense of power that he has over her and not from any sort of like fun aspects like it mm, mm. so he just bullies her all the time and then he's like oh i just think that like you know it's your fault the way you are you know you just act like a victim all the time, that's why everyone treats you like a victim. And then, now that we've had sex, I, sw- I actually want to own you. Say it if it's a fun, silly thing, but do not say it if you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, after sex, I want to own you. Fucking chill out. Fallon then finds out that Ben has an agent, and then she's like, oh, I can't make him give everything up. He's gotta, he's gotta, you know, live his life. He's gotta write this book, and I can't get in the way of that. And he's obviously like, oh, it's fine. I'm, I could just write another book. And because they kind of decided to stay together. But then he's like, she's like, no, I'm going to leave because, you know, I can't, I can't risk your career. And then he's like, I'll just write another book. And I'm like, can't you write this one and make it up? Is that not mostly what people are doing? Like, I don't think they fucking picked this up because they want it to be like a real life story. I'm pretty sure it's just like the concept of a romance novel. Just fucking make it up. <laughs> So then, then Fallon's gonna leave. She's like, I'm on my way out for the best. I've decided. She's actually doing a bit of Edward, really. <laughs> she said, I don't want you to come. And then also because she's like, fair enough. She's like, it's been an emotional few days. Your brother just passed. Let's not make any big decisions. And he's like, obviously, you're a bitch and I hate you. <laughs> That's not what he says. What he says and said, no, Fallon, you can't just agree to love me and then take it back because you think it's not what best for me that's not how this works and and she's like this is too much and she's like waiting by the cab and then so she tries to tell him that she doesn't really love him so he'll leave he'll leave her alone she's like oh if we're meant to be together three years is nothing and then he obviously is being normal um and says meant to be together you listening to yourself this isn't one of your fairy tales balan this is real life in the real world you have to bust your ass for the happy ever after he's like please don't go and she's going they're also being so dramatic. Like, can she not just go in like three days and be like, I think I'm gonna go home and I think you should stay here. But like, she obviously has to like run away. But I'm not gonna lie. It's the one fucking good impulse she has in this book. And then he says, I've never wanted to use physical force on a girl before, but I want to push her to the ground and hold her there until the cab drives away. Okay, Ben. Okay. And we have more bad poetry. There's also quite sinister if you ask me from Benton James Kessler. In her darkness, she is silent. In my darkness, she screams. Fucking hell. If that doesn't say I want to murder this bitch, I don't know what does. And then we get to maybe my favorite, November 9th. So Ben turns up with the baby. The baby is Jordan's and Kyle's baby, Oliver. And they're just kind of talking. And you know what he says? He said, it's it's good to see you. And for me, we're clocking. The vibe's different. That vibe is we're exes we've walked into each other that's what that vibe is she's a bit like oh he's brought the baby because he's just such a good uncle and then they're talking about the baby's first word and he says he did say his first curse word though we keep his baby monitor on at night and last week clear as day he said the word shit and then she's like we we keep the baby mon we and um yeah ben is fucking jordan his dead brother's wife I would like a small caveat to say I don't want to be judgmental about people when they're experiencing grief because they will, you know, people do weird stuff. It's whatever. This is actually like a topic that's really interestingly explored, I think, in Johnny Nelson's The Skies Everywhere. But once again, Ben is treating this like an act of fate. He's like, what could you do? Like, we just were like hanging out with the baby and like with each other and we both kind of sad. So we just like started having sex and being like a weird family, even though I'm his stepdad uncle, man. You know. <laughs> and also he still goes to fucking see her. Like why did, why have you gone to see your like weird, like, I don't know, like romance date person, but your fucking like your dead wife brother? Surely that'll take over. New book. New book is I started fucking my dead wife's no, my dead brother's wife. <laughs> just mental. Did not see that one fucking coming. I'll tell you that. I did not see that one coming. And for some reason he's like, oh, I didn't mean for it to happen. What can you do? 
and she's obviously fucking heartbroken and like humiliated. I think the thing is like Colleen Hoover is not a good enough writer to have like really explored the emotional depths of this kind of storyline so it does just come off as fucking stupid. And then he's like she lied to me? Fallon lied when she said she didn't want to be with me and she didn't love me? I, but the thing is, for me, the overriding emotion in this scene is that it's very clear she's leaving for his own good. Like, it's not even Moulin Rouge kind of vibes where she is like really trying to pretend that she doesn't love him. It's very clear that she's leaving because she's like, I don't want to ruin your life and everything's just like fucking blown up. Like, every, like you're having a really difficult time and I don't want to like make you do really big weird things like move to New York or like move in with me and all this stuff and then he's like what oh my god what do you mean I thought I thought we were over and also like if you did why the fuck did you come and see her on this day like other than that you've got like a weird addiction to it because you're the one who fucking caused the fire like it doesn't matter that Fallon left such a big hole in my heart I couldn't help it if somebody else found their way in it doesn't matter that Jordan and I were both destroyed after the death of Kyle it doesn't matter that things didn't progress between us until well after Oliver was born. It's like he's like, don't worry, I didn't fuck her when she was pregnant. <laughs> like, I can't remember how pregnant- I think she was quite pregnant when they saw each other last, but it does make me laugh, because I don't know whether he's trying to make the distinction that he's like, I'd never fuck my pregnant dead brother's wife, only afterwards. <laughs> or if he's just trying to be like, you know, it was time passing. I don't know what his point is really. But once again, this is Ben's, oh, it's fate. What could I do? I just think that lots of people in this situation don't do that. Like they don't, they just don't go down that route. <laughs> like, just really think that's probably what, what the truth is, to be honest. And then in true Ben style, she drops her keys to her car. He picks them up. He holds them away from her. And then he like locks her in, either locks the keys in his car and makes them, I think that he makes them sit and have a conversation in his car, which is like, can you fucking stop kicking this bitch when she's down? Like, <laughs> you literally come and see her after you've, you know, she doesn't know it yet, but you've, you know, derailed her life. You've caused her to have a massive traumatic event. And then you fucking turn up when you're supposed to be in love with the baby of your brother and then you also kind of make it clear that you've been sleeping with his wife. Like, can you not just leave her alone? Like, Jesus Christ. What else do you want from her? Give her a break. Oh my God. And then we get to the next November 9th where they're not hanging out. Ben turns up at the club that Fallon and her friend are at with the friend and the boyfriend of the friend. And then it becomes clear that the boyfriend of Fallon's friend has given the address of where they're going to Ben. A man he's probably met two, once, twice, and you know, do you know that this man's not a stalker? Like, if a man comes up to my apartment and like gets, like, he's like demanding to know where I am, and you don't know him, you haven't heard about him, don't tell him where I am. Don't fucking do that. It's really weird and it's really dangerous. I would be like, what if he's a stalker? And Loki kind of is. So she goes off to the bathroom, she's got a date, he's obviously not hot, he's also thick. Because, you know, there can't possibly be even a better, slightly better option than, like, and someone who's committed arson against you, but... And fucked his brother's step... stepbrother's wife. Da 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 da. And he's like, so she's like, are you still with Jordan? And he's like, you know me better than that, Balan. If I had a girlfriend, I wouldn't be here. I don't know, Ben. There's a lot of things that you, you're up to in this book. Like, I don't think I'd draw the line at cheating. <laughs> Like, everything else that this man does in this book is way worse, I think, than possibly, like, hanging around someone you fancy when you have a girlfriend. He obviously pushes her into a cupboard, they, like, have- they, like, they, like, make out and stuff. But, like, this is very clear that this is the scene that got changed, because, um, he's just kind of- the way he's- he's just touching her and it's like, oh, and she's a bit like, no. He buries his face against my neck and breathes me in and I forget everything I was about to protest. My head drops back against the wall and his hand slides around the back of my thigh. His fingers graze the edge of my panties and when I- oh, sorry. <laughs> and when I feel them slip just beneath the hair, my whole body shudders. I open my mouth to protest, but I am met with heat and tongue and lips that just know how to make it all work together. Instead of the words stop coming at him, all he gets in a moment and a hand in his hair pulling and pushing indecisive. He pushes against me, his leg between both of mine, he's kissing me so hard. And I know I should stop him, I should push him away and make him explain himself. His hands feel too good 
for that right now. And then he's like, come home with me. And she's like, no. Her date is looking for her. Um, and he's obviously a bit of a twat and he's not dressed well and like all this stuff. And we find out that the fucking friend's boyfriend tells um, Ben where they are, even though he could be literally anyone. And then they're all like, ooh, we love each other. We're so, so cute together. So then they like, they go home together and they're, you know, happy and nice and together. And then essentially that what happens next is they have like a proper chat and he's like, look, you need to understand all of it's always gonna be part of my life. You know, he's so important to me. And I'm like, I think we fucking got that, mate. Oh my God. Also, I think we would have got that without everything else that you've been up to. You know, Fallon's like, why did you get the word poetic tattooed on you? And he's like, personal reasons. I'll tell you about it one day. Like, once again, mate, you're genuinely, you've <laughs> stalked this woman, but she can't ask you one fucking simple question and you give an honest answer. <laughs> can't cope. Then obviously she finds the manuscript and she starts reading it. And the page that it's open on is the day that Kyle punches Ben in the face. So then we're on that scene and obviously it's from their perspective. So Kyle is like, your fucking girlfriend. And Ben's like, I swear it's not like that. I just, this is so fucked up. I like her, okay? <laughs> I like her. And it doesn't matter that I was the one who started the fucking fire at her house that nearly killed her. It's just not important, you know? It's complicated. It's love. <laughs> Fallon actually has like an adequate response and fucking like runs away and is like hiding <laughs> from this man because she's afraid of him. The best decision she's had all, all the way through the book. And then we got one of Ben's quotes again, which is fate. A word meaning destiny, fate, a word meaning doom. It's not fate, it's your own actions. It's what you've done <laughs> deliberately throughout the book. Like that's, that's what it is, it's your fault. It's not fate. And one of the best things she does the entire book is she goes and get a restraining order against Ben. And then Ben comes and violates the restraining order by delivering the manuscript to her. And then her mum is coming to see her and her mum comes in without her knowing and reads the manuscript and I was like, oh, really, we're gonna get some real sense here. We're gonna get some normal fucking reactions to stuff. But instead, the craziest thing that happens in this book, I would say, is this moment where, so her mum reads how basically her daughter has been tricked into this relationship with the guy who fucking started the fire, causing a massive traumatic moment in her life and physical scarring on her body. And you know what her mum fucking says? <laughs> Her mum says, I'm not gonna pretend that I know what you've gone through, but after reading those pages, I can assure you that you aren't the only one who's scarred in that fire. What? <laughs> Your daughter has been tricked into a relationship with the man who fucking started the fire. <laughs> and you, you think everyone's had a bad time. What? This is the bit where I feel like we genuinely leave like the orbit of reality. We're somewhere else now. This feels like a fever dream where like the mother is possessed by someone. And then she's like, just because he chose not to show you his scars doesn't mean they don't exist. That's because they're not scars, they're regrets. They're his actions, once again, that people are just treating like it's all like, oh my God, who could have seen this coming? Who could have avoided this? I feel like pretty fucking easily we could have avoided this. <laughs> and she says, she picks up the box and sets it on my lap. Here they are. He's put his scars on full display for you, and you need to show them the respect he showed you by not turning away from them. <laughs> Where are we? What reality are we in? That this. If my mum said this to me, I'd be like, something bad's happened. She's possessed. We don't know her. We need to contact the government. Something bad has happened. Aliens are on Earth. This is the stupidest fucking part of this fucking book. Genuinely, no one's connected to reality. Her mother is like, Fallon, you're being so fucking judgmental right now. This guy who committed arson didn't mean it. <laughs> ah! Once again, I have compassion for people. I can understand where we could have compassion in these kind of moments. But like, everything that this boy has done has been fucked up and stupid. He's lured this girl into a relationship two years after he set fire and nearly killed her. Like, what? Oh my God. And that's why she reads the fucking book. Oh my God. Devastating. And then we immediately smash to Ben's perspective of when he finds his mother dead. 
She's taken her own life. He has a really amazing perspective on it, a really unexpected perspective, given everything else that we've heard from him. And um, he essentially doesn't, he doesn't read her suicide note because suicide is the most selfish thing a person can do. Oh my God. It doesn't get any better, it only gets worse. He basically reads his mother's text and concludes that she's broken up with Donovan O'Neill, who is Fallon's dad. And obviously he's like, oh, he, he's at fault. It's his fault that my mother killed herself. And then he goes to his house. And then he basically, I think, opportunistically sets fire to the car and to the house. I don't know how he gets away with like people not realizing this was arson. They're like, it's, a, it's an accident. I'm like, I just think that people who look at fires breaking out for a living would be able to tell this was fucking deliberate. Yeah, especially like he literally picks up the gas can and pours the liquid all over the tire and up the side of the car. Like, I'm pretty sure someone would be able to work it out quite easily that that's arson, but anyway. And then he's so sad and he's like, oh fuck, I've committed arson. Yep. And he gets home and Kyle covers for him because he's a nice older brother, I suppose. And then basically he finds out from his other brother that his mother didn't actually commit suicide because she broke up with a man, but because she had incurable cancer. So essentially he's just committed this massive arson for no reason. He's done it for no reason. Basically, he then goes on to describe what it's like when they first meet and like what he thinks of her essentially. And he also continues to be like, oh my god, she's got so much spunk and she's so, you know, she's so sassy and feisty. Love when girls are feisty. Watching her again and he's like, she's such a firecracker. Also, bad choice, come on. I'm thinking maybe this has got a fun twist ending. Maybe this is, ooh, we're gonna get something out of this fucking ending. So then that he's waiting at the restaurant, it's getting to midnight, she's not there yet, but then she arrives. He realises she's smiling. And I'm like, she's smiling because she's got a gun. She's gonna kill him. She's gonna run him over in her car. Wouldn't that be good? No, he, he does the most non-alpha thing he could possibly do. Cry like a fucking baby. They hug and, um, and he looks at her and she says, I didn't come here to forgive you. And I'm like, here we go. This is it. This is it. This is it. And then she says, you've carried so much guilt for what you did and for so long. No. You can't ask my forgiveness because there's nothing to forgive. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, I'm here for your forgiveness. What? <laughs> this point, I was like, I feel like I've been shot. What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm here for your forgiveness. How? Oh my god! She says, I should have given you the chance to explain it then, and if I just listened to you, then we could have avoided an entire year of heartache. For, so for that, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, and I hope you can forgive me. Oh! Oh my god! Stand up, please! Where are we? You're genuinely in a different realm. Come on, this is... <laughs> what do you mean? And then they both forgive each other. And they're like, aha, they, they actually, no, they both forgive themselves in each other's presence. And then she shows them her fucking shite tattoo that she's got now. <laughs> and um, they live happily ever after. And they also do a little spoiler alert at the end. Because we can't forget it's fucking 2012. And that's it. That's the end of the fucking book. Oh my god. This book made me feel ill while I read it. It made me feel like I'm disconnected from fucking reality. And people are like, I love this romance. I love these people together. I love this couple. And I genuinely wanna be like, babes, my love, please seek help. If you think this is a love story, seek help. This is the opposite of fucking Fleabag, this is a love story. This isn't a love story. This is a man nearly killed you two years ago. He sneaks back into hit into your life and then dates you and then writes a book about it and you fucking tell him you forgive him for all this? And also for some reason he also has to fuck his brother's widow? What? <laughs> this, I, it was like a fever dream. It was genuinely like a fever dream and I, I, never read anything like it. At least I can say that, Colleen Hoover. I have never read anything like it, but I can't even, I don't even know what to say. This is, this book, this book is incel fantasy. This book is fucking men just get to do whatever they want. 
silly boys, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing when they deliberately commit arson after coming to really stupid conclusions. And like, again, another caveat. I love a delusion. I love Othello by Shakespeare. Like literally a play about a man like succumbing to delusions. But you know what? At least he had a fucking devil in his ear. He had Iago literally spinning the web of deception in front of him. This man is just evil. <laughs> and Fallon, Fallon is literally maybe abused by this man. Like the way the, the narratives about sex in here, the way like it doesn't seem like something that to be enjoyed, it seems like something to endure. And then like the narratives of ownership, like the fact that he's so weird and like kind of fetishy about the scars that he caused and then also bullies her for feeling insecure when she's basically faced with, you know, like a kind of ableism. Like, <laughs> uh, the way in which I can't even, it's crazy to me. Like this is situation, I've, I've got nothing left to say to be honest. I'll probably talk for fucking too long anyway. But yes, thank you for watching. I hope to never read a book like this again, and I wish you well. Speak to you later. Bye ya! Oh, I think we fucking missed it. Anyway, then we get to maybe my favourite November 4th. This is the bit where I feel like we genuinely leave, like, the orbit of reality.